Welcome. I'm Carl Frederick, and I will be interviewing individuals for Kenosha Voices, an oral history project of the Kenosha County Historical Society in conjunction with Kenosha Community Media. I have worked in newspapers for more than 40 years as an editor and a reporter. 38 and a half of those years were at the Kenosha News. I am also a member of the Kenosha County Historical Society Board. We hope you enjoy these programs. I'm speaking with Mayor John Antaramian, who's retiring at the end of his term in 2024. Thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. How did your family come to Kenosha? Well, that's a good question. My grandfather uh, came, to, uh, came to the United States in roughly 1890. Um, my grandmother was still in Armenia with their oldest son, um, and so he spent close to 10 years in this country before he brought my grandmother over. Uh, he was uh, an interesting character. He um, initially had a, uh, with uh, some other partners, a coal mine in uh, Kentucky. Um, sold that, bought a gold mine in California. Um, actually did very well, but um, the there's a, an interesting story on how they lost the gold mine, but that doesn't need to be done here today. Lost the gold mine, and um, he came to Kenosha and worked at uh, um, the bicycle shops. The um, oh my goodness, a terrible thing doing. You'll, you go blank on a, a Sterling a, bicycle shop. It was not Sterling, but it was, um, it was a Chicago bicycle. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, it was one of the bicycle shops. Okay, I, I, I know the name, and I'm just going blank. All right. Anyway, um, came back. Um, uh, eventually uh, got his, brought his wife, my grandmother, over and their oldest child, um, and they uh, lived in Kenosha. Okay. okay, and so you attended Kenosha schools, That's graduated correct. from Tremper. That, yep, I graduated from Tremper in 73, went on to, I graduated from UW Parkside four years later. Um, and between that period of time, I always joke, because it's always one of those things, I did gold mining for, uh, my brother and I took off and did some gold mining um, when, we were, when I was in school. So I had a lot of fun doing that. So did that, uh, came back after school, um, graduated from Parkside, uh, stayed in Kenosha, uh, worked for Walgreens Corporation, and um, eventually ran for the State Assembly. What year was that? Uh, the first time I ran for the State Assembly was 1980, and I lost that election to Gene Dorf by 196 votes. I ran again in 1982 and won that election. Okay, and <clears throat> what were your, your goals seeking Assembly seat? Well, it's interesting when you think back that, it's hard to believe it's, you know, when you think back 40 plus years. Um, I think it was just more of a question of I thought it was something I could do that would that could be helpful to people. Um, and so that's my logic for running at the time. Um, and was very fortunate I was able to serve the 65th Assembly District for 10 years. Hey, uh, and what were some of the goals, what, your campaign? What did you run on? Oh my goodness. Um, that's tougher to think back of, of, of exactly what it was, the issues of the time. Uh, healthcare, um, capital gains, health care, were two of the big ones that I ran on um, because I was, I, there's a huge need for, and, and this goes back as I said, and looking at health care needs for the community for people who did not have health care. Um, so that was one of my huge targets of, of projects that I always wanted to, that I worked on <clears throat> during my legislative years. Okay. And you left the assembly, you said, after 10 years. Right. I served, uh, the, I served on a number of committees in the assembly, but probably the three that were most important was I served on the Joint Committee of Administrative Rules, which reviewed all the rules in the state, uh, which was a, a very, very interesting committee. I served on the Joint Finance Committee, which is the budget writing committee for the state. And I served on a special committee on welfare reform. and. Uh, we wrote the welfare reform laws in the state of Wisconsin um, in that two-year period of time when um, I chaired that committee. Okay, so when it came time that you decided I've had enough of the assembly and I want to be mayor or 
I would have stayed in the assembly, but the opportunity to do something different, how did that come about? No, a couple of, a couple of reasons for leaving the assembly. Um, as much as I enjoyed the assembly, there was a point in time, and I think one of the problems most politicians have is we don't know when it's time to leave. Um, and when something stops be tr becoming truly fun with what you're doing and you feel like you're accomplishing things, then it's time to move on. I had just finished um, serving on the finance committee. I had uh, gotten a number of pieces of legislation that I thought were important passed. Welfare reform was being one of them. Um, a couple of other pieces dealing with the um, um, innovation center type of concept that we were doing in Kenosha early on. Uh, so there, there was a number of pieces of legislation that I was involved in that I, I wanted to see happen. I had accomplished them, and now I reached that point where it was, do you want to stay? Do you want to go? I had a young family. Just all sorts of different issues that, that played on that, and I made the decision that it was time to come home. Okay. And was running for mayor one of the reasons for coming home, or did you plan a different job, perhaps? No, I really hadn't initially planned on what I was going to do. Um, but the situation with the mayor's situation occurred, and I made the decision to run, and, and have been very fortunate that the public has allowed me to serve them for the last 20, for 24 years. Okay, and your campaign for mayor, what did that focus on? Different times, different issues. Um, at the time when I uh, ran for um, the uh, mayor's job, you had a very huge upheaval in, in Kenosha with Chrysler closing in 88. You had a number of other major corporations closing down. You had the Brass, you had McWhite. All of these things were all in downsizing at the time. So economics was a huge piece of, of what I was running on. And, and a concept of zero-based budgeting was another piece of what I was looking at when I first ran. Okay, and in your first two terms as mayor, did you accomplish the goals that you were just speaking of? Well, actually we did. We created industrial parks. Um, so the city literally had, industrial, uh, had a new industrial park uh, on the western end. Uh, we did modify our budgeting process. Uh, those two things were, were definitely done. And we worked with trying to get, you know, basically looking at government, how do we bring the government into the future? And we worked on that a great deal. And again, all those things, none of those things happen by themselves. People sometimes think mayors can just do things. It doesn't work that way. You have to have council of approval. You have to have all sorts of things that you need to have done. But even more importantly, you need to have the public willing to let you make change. You know, housing was a huge issue in those days when we started the, the very vast housing program in the city of Kenosha, single family homes in the older neighborhoods. Those type of things were also very, very, uh, we were very aggressive on in those, those early terms. Uh, but also, I was fortunate I had good people in city government. And I think sometimes that's one of the things that gets lost um, to people in the sense of, like what you're doing, you're interviewing me and that's great. But the reality comes down to is without those individuals who are there to help make these things happen, you know, we wouldn't have succeeded. Okay, and after eight years, you had accomplished those goals and? Well, I actually, it was 16 years, not eight. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm the, first, the first go around was 16 years. Okay. Um, and again, accomplishing goals change. Goals change constantly. If, they, if you're not changing, I, I, I think one of my favorite quotes, and I, I can't tell you who it was who actually did it, so forgive me. But for cities, you either move forward or you move backwards. There's no staying the same. You're moving one way or the other, and if you're doing nothing, you're moving backwards. Um, so when you keep on trying to bring up what goals do I have, the issue comes down to what goals were needed at the time. What, were, what did we have to get done? And when you look at that time frame, you did Harbor Park, we did industrial parks, the city grew dramatically, we did boundary agreements. All those things are things that we accomplish. Do you accomplish everything? No. No, never. And if you do accomplish everything, then you're in trouble because, you know, even though I said that kind of in the state legislature part, <laughs> it's a little different because it's legislation that you accomplish. But when you're a mayor, things change, or, or things are constantly changing. And so you do not have a set bar of saying, okay, we did this and, and now we're done. That's not how it works. And so at the time you left, after 16 years, was there something you were disappointed in that 
didn't happen? Oh, there's always things you're disappointed in, or always things that you did wrong. And <laughs> there's nothing that ever is perfect in what you do and how you do it. I like to think of, I left the city in better shape at that point in time than I found it, and I believe I did. Um, I think we did a lot of interesting things and we accomplished a great deal. But again, the goals change, they have to. You cannot, if, if, if it goes back to my, my statement before, you move forward or you move backwards. And if you think you've, you've now accomplished all your goals, you're not moving forward anymore. Okay, so that at the end of these first 16 years, why was it time to step away from being mayor? It was time to step away for a number of different reasons. One is, again, it kind of stopped being, I shouldn't say stopped being fun, but let's say that I enjoyed going to work and going into work three days a week instead of five days a week. You, you, you reach a point on sometimes of, it's just the right time for you to walk away and let someone else see what they can do. Um, and so that's from my perspective how I looked at it. I was tired. Um, I spent a, a lot of time in government and it was just time for me, I think, to walk away, recharge my batteries and look to do something else, which is what I did. And what did you do then after you left that mayor term? When I left mayor, I basically started my own company um, and I did work for cities and for the EPA. Uh, I did environmental, uh, not remediation in itself, but help people who had environmental sites uh, helping them how to remediate the sites, how to plan, how to find funding, how to do the different things like that. So I did that for a number of, of cities and communities. Um, I also did a little, I did uh, some teaching at Carthage College, which was fun. Um, and so that's what I ended up, you know, basically targeting and doing uh, for eight years. And how did you develop a background and some experience in the brownfield type of work? Well, I was involved in the legislature uh, on brownfields. I also was involved, uh, when I left the legislature, I was involved in a committee that had been created to work on how to get redevelopment occurring in brownfield sites. Because you had a lot of sites and not a lot of law dealing with how brownfields had to be done. So I spent uh, many years um, on a special committee dealing with brownfields and redevelopment of brownfields. Uh, so I worked with the DNR and with the private sector on that. It was a broad committee put together by DNR. Um, so I did that, and plus I spent 16 years redoing brownfield sites in the city of Kenosha. We helped create a lot of the laws that are in place today um, because of the work that we did and the work we did working with uh, the DNR. And I, I always have to mention two names, um, Darcy Foss and Pam Malata. And I mention their names because they deserve a huge amount of credit. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. Those two women did a huge amount of work to help us to redevelop the brownfields in the city of Kenosha. Pam, in her expertise of dealing with um, specific sites, you know, I could go to Pam and say, okay, Pam, I've got this problem. How do I fix this? She said, this is what you can do, or this is what you can't do. She was definitive. She gave you the ability to say, yes, I'm going to do something, or no, I'm not wonderful person to work with and I, I give her a ton of credit for a lot of the projects that we have that have succeeded because she could make decisions and just help us move forward. Uh, Darcy was similar, only Darcy was higher up in the, in the programs, but Darcy also is the one who made it so that the city of Kenosha got $10 million for the Chrysler site. Without her involvement, we would have been bypassed by the federal courts. She saw what was going on in the federal courts got the whole of the Attorney General, got the Attorney General involved, and got us into the, the lineup for getting some funds when very few communities, communities got funds from the Chrysler deal. We were one of them, we got $10 million. So you gotta give her a ton of credit. She was uh, just a remarkable individual. And those two women deserve a tremendous amount of credit for our success. And just to step back, did you find your experience in the legis legislature of a lot of benefit when you were a uh, mayor? Huge. Um, partly because of the Joint Committee of Administrative Rules Committee and also finance. Um, because I was so involved in the budgets and how they worked for finance, that was a huge help for me. And then the other piece being the Joint Committee of Administrative Rules, I worked with the bureaucracy all the time. Because rules would come out from the bureaucracy, it had to go to the committee, it would be reviewed, we would agree, disagree, modify. Committee had a huge amount of authority. We could actually take a rule, 
and kill it for two years if we didn't like it. So the department sat down and worked with us and we worked with them to make sure that we didn't get into that situation because that didn't benefit anybody. Um, so when we had issues, we were able to sit down, we worked them through, and it helped me to understand their process, but it also helped me to know a whole bunch of people so that when I had a problem, I could call someone and say, here's my problem, can you help me? And that in itself is a huge benefit um, from coming from the legislature to being mayor. Okay, and then you worked on Brownfield Consulting uh, for how long? Eight years. Eight years. And did it get more like it was fun three days a week instead of five? No, that was, was just fun. <laughs> I enjoyed that. It's, 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 not, it's, it's, it's very different when you're advising someone, here's what you need to do, here's how you do it. You, you can present to people what they should do and what you think they should do. But in the end, it's their decision. So they then have to make the determination of, do they want to go this route, not go this route? They have a concern about doing it this way. Is there a different way of doing it? And those are, to me, was all, that was always fun. I enjoyed that immensely. And then why did you leave that work? Partly because I got concerned about the young people in our community. Um, and that really played on me. I had two children. One is here, one is gone. Um, and it was just kind of, I kept on looking at it, what did we do that we don't, aren't able to keep more of our young people here? And that's what got me back into running this the last time, for the last eight years. Okay. So what kind of ideas did you have at the time about keeping young people in the community? Well, it's interesting. I looked at it from a perspective of economics. So the first piece of the economics was, what do we have here that are going to keep young people here in the sense of jobs? Good paying jobs, jobs that challenge young people, jobs that are going to be tech heavy in, in a lot of ways. How we, what are we doing to, do, to bring that industry here? And that was the, the key to what I started looking at. And as I got into that, I, I pulled in a couple of companies that we worked with, uh, Snap-on and Jockey being the two, and worked with them and talking with them about, and brought on a consultant, did a whole bunch of things to start working on what is it we need to do. And, and we put together what you now have is the Kin neighborhood. And that was a huge number of people participating and working, talking about how do we, you know, do we put a school there? That's how you ended up following, eventually getting the STEM high school. A gentleman named uh, Leo Chiapetta was the big push on the school. Um, and so there are things that, that, as we talked about things, we brought people together and started looking at what we can do. We actually kind of eventually um, went into what the Kin neighborhood is. Now, I say eventually because initially I was looking at an R&D park, research and development park. And um, as the conversations went and as we talked with people, that wasn't the right route. So we ended up taking a copy out of um, um, St. Louis, a company, a, a entity called Cortex, which is a um, innovation center in St. Louis that I chose as kind of the model because it fit us. Now, St. Louis is much larger, has different problems than we have, but the economics were something. They had gone through a large number of, of companies leaving uh, and those type of things, and they were looking to reinvent themselves. And so we followed up on what they had done and then looked all over the country at different innovation centers. And then we picked, and you know, we did a little picking here, picking there, and kind of brought that together using the model, though, at Cortex, because I like the model at Cortex the best. And that was basically targeting entrepreneurs, uh, training for young people to get into tech jobs, all of the different things that we did, and which is kind of what we've now put together with Kin, with a, a non-for-profit board. But you also have the um, redevelopment that's happening in the uptown with the housing that went in. On the first floor, there's a restaurant, a, a grocery store, and a reading library. Why the reading library? Because that is some of our lowest scores in a reading is this in, in that neighborhood and in the six neighborhoods surrounding it. So we're targeting to make sure that we get the reading scores in, those, in that older neighborhood up. So that was why you had that there. We've then bought the Brown Bank building, which is now the Kela building, it's called. And the Kela building has a number of non-for-profits in it. All the colleges, the four colleges are in there, uh, Parkside, Carthage, Herzing, and Gateway all have staff in that, in that building. 
You also have in that building um, the Y with their teen program, Mahone with their internship program. You have, um, there's a jobs component that will be in the building also. Uh, entity called Generator, which works with um, entrepreneurs to start their own businesses. We have uh, funding for them, we got them in that building. Um, and you have, through Jockey and the Y, they're, and Best Buy teaming up to build an, a, a, tech, a little tech center in the building itself. So they will be basically uh, teaching coding in that facility. So it's a huge opportunity. And we're the second smallest city to get one of those Best Buy tech centers. So it's really neat. So that's in the building. And now we're working with the building trades and the business community to do some things in the basements that we're doing. And I, I'd love to find a company, if I can, who wants to do something with robots. I'd love to get something with robots in that building to, to really atta to attract young kids and to that, that concept of what's going on. But anyway, I digress on that issue. But those, so that's in that building. So you now have elementary reading program. You have middle and high school programs. And then you have a STEM high school on the kin site. And that was what we were trying to do. You need to tie the education with the entrepreneurs because you need to make sure that the young people in the neighborhood have the ability to move up and to um, get the education they need so that we can do those things. And in the Kin um, neighborhood also with the uh, elementary school or the um, middle school, or high school, you also have gateway involvement in that building. So they will be there with training and other types of activities. And right across the street, we've now broken ground on the incubator facility, which will be the first uh, building that is going to be built for entrepreneurial activities and young people. So that will be a facility to bring young people into and learn to develop, try out an idea, right. create a business. And, and at the same time, and if you look at the Cortex model, you'll find corporations put R&D around the area because what they're doing is they're looking for talent and they're looking for ideas. And what this starts to do is draw ideas, and that draws the industry with the other, with looking at talent and with um, product use that they may want to buy. Okay. Now, as we talk about the Kin neighborhood, we're we're speaking of the 107 acres that had housed the American Motors Chrysler assembly plant. That's correct. Correct. And you mentioned this incubator facility and the new high school. STEM high school. What else is going to be on this property? It seems like those two things aren't going to fill it up. Oh, no. You, that's where I said. You have the business community that still has to come in with R&D, uh, small R&D sites. There'll be some commercial on the site. There'll be housing on the site. It, is a, it becomes part of a neighborhood that then has to reach into the rest of the neighborhood so that the fabric of the neighborhood is basically um, filled so you don't have a hole in the middle of the city. Uh, with an empty site. So that all is combined with what we're doing. Okay. And what about the <coughs> Uptown area, the development that started in, in Uptown? You have the um, Gorman project that has 71 units of housing. It's workforce housing, so the rents are about $1,100 a month. Has underground parking, it has the restaurant, grocery store, which is badly needed in the area, and the reading library on the first floor and then 71 units of housing above it. So we've added housing to the neighborhood. Okay. Now, that's, so that's just the start. I mean, you, yeah. there's more to be done on 22nd Avenue. It's just a matter of timing and a matter of, of individuals who own property there who, you know, sometimes people feel that their property is worth a great deal more than what a developer might think it's worth. So things don't always move as rapidly as everyone would like them to move. Okay, you have a, a downtown vision that has started to move, mm -hmm. um, what do you in think is going to end up in this downtown project? Oh my goodness. Um, you're going to see a, eventually a new city hall. You will see a hotel um, and you will see a great deal of housing and some commercial on the first floors. You'll see a market um, that they're looking to build. and two office buildings that are also being looked, and then basically mid-rise housing um, in the downtown. And I say mid-rise because uh, in reality, 10 to 14 stories is mid-rise nowadays. Um, Kenosha, we don't 
we consider that considerably higher than mid-rise, but the reality is it's mid-rise housing. And then there's um, a, a, larger, a larger housing uh, piece included in that. There'll be a parks, there'll be fountains, waterways. Uh, we're looking to revamp the veterans um, walkway so that we can actually uh, include the um, Korean War veterans and the Vietnam War veterans in that. Uh, we'll be working with the veterans on that. That hasn't started yet. And I, actually, I feel badly I was intended to get it started sooner than I, it's happened. But before I leave, I'm, my intention is to get uh, a committee going to start to bring the, the veterans groups in and sit down and talk with them. What is it they want? How would they like to see this work? And create a whole walkway and a history so that people actually understand what our veterans have done. So you mentioned different elements of this plan. What is the first thing that has to happen to get the rest of the things started? Well, the first thing that has to happen has already happened. The, um, the developers have come to the city with a uh, plan for the first two buildings. Now, there's the, the, the rough dr drafts of it, they have to come back. So the first building will come back, I believe, probably in, within the next 60 days at the latest, and they will start construction on that building this year. The second building, uh, is a, and the first building is a five-story building, about 160 units. The second building is about, a, is a 10-story building and about 180 units. Um, so that one, I think we'll get the plans done for that one this year, the 10-story the one, and probably construction next year. But the other one, the five-story one, will start this year and construction will start this year. Okay, well, in the last year or so, they have flattened the old police building and visitor center building and as my understanding is that is the site for the new city hall. That's correct. What is the time frame of building that building and moving the old one out? 2026, 2027, somewhere in there is my guess. Hopefully we'll be in by 2027 at the latest. Is that building going to reflect the other buildings? Yes. In? The design of the exterior design of that building is, is meant to fit in with the courthouse and the post office. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about the casino briefly. Okay. There was an attempt a long time ago, 20 years or so, trying to get a casino. Uh, people seem to be in favor. That didn't happen. Is there anything really different today? For well, it's, it's interesting to me. It's been, I think, and I might be wrong on this, I think this is about the fifth request for a casino in town. Uh, the first couple we didn't even look at very seriously because we didn't think they were very serious offers. Um, but over time, you've had a couple of them that have, the last two actually, which are both the Menominee, um, have been real offers. And we have negotiated, I think, very good agreements. Um, and as I always tell people, it's, it's not a question of whether you agree or disagree with the a casino, that's, that's an issue that is voted, that's decided by the council in the end. But my job is to make sure you have an agreement that is going to protect the city and benefit the city. And we have that. So I feel very comfortable with the agreement itself. Um, and I think the issue of a hard rock and the venue that it brings is a, in a very appealing uh, option for the city of Kenosha. Okay. Museums have been an interest of yours. You've advocated for museums. There, that two have been built. Yeah, I, I, I always, I always talk about the one that got away. <laughs> um, there were two other, and two other developments I would have liked to have done. But in the end, you know, I, and again, I always tell people, financing becomes the key to anything you do. And it's not just financing to build something. Building something is a lot easier than people think. It's operations that becomes an issue. So you have to be able to build and operate whatever you put together. So we've done two museums. Um, I wanted to do a third museum, and I also wanted to do a performing arts center, in which case uh, we came close on the performing arts center, but regrettably the financing fell through, and so that didn't go forward. Um, but I always, like, I always joke about my museum that got away. Back in 2007, I always thought that we should have a Revolutionary War Museum. Now, everyone always says, a Revolutionary War Museum in Wisconsin? At the time, there were no Revolutionary War Museums in the United States. We would have been the first. 
Philadelphia didn't have theirs. The one at Valley Forge that they're building wasn't, wasn't going. We would have been the first Revolutionary War Museum in the country. And I think that by itself would have been fascinating because we have a rich history in the Revolutionary War. Well, I shouldn't say we have a rich history in the Civil War. Revolutionary War, we weren't much of, a, of an impact, though there were a few things that did happen here, but um, nothing major. But I looked at it more in the sense of an opportunity to tell the history of this country. And I, I'm a big believer that we really do not do a very good job with history. Um, so what I did is I approached the British government and asked them for $15 million to build a wing of a Revolutionary War Museum. And my pitch to them was, we will tell the story of the Revolutionary War from the British perspective in that wing. So we'll tell your story. You tell us what the story is, and we'll tell that story so that people have an, an understanding of what the British and how they looked at the Revolutionary War. And they said it wasn't a Revolutionary War, it was a War of the Great Rebellion. <laughs> so I go, well, you can name it anything you want. <laughs> I don't care. I want $15 million to build the building. We'll operate it, but you need to, but we'll tell your story. And everyone goes, well, that's kind of interesting, but what about the U.S. side? And I said, well, once I had the British agreement to do this, I was then going to turn to the federal government and say, the British are coming, what are you going to do for us? And so I was going to hit them for $15 million to build the other wing. And you would have had a, a, a museum that would have told the story of the Revolution War from both the British and American perspective. And I think that's just fascinating as a way of education. Um, regrettably, the British government said no. Um, I didn't have enough time to put some things together because I had a, a woman in the British consulate in Chicago who I had met who was intrigued by the idea and once men made the comment to me that, she'd, that if I put a proposal together and got it to her, she said that she'd, be, she'd love to get, introduce me to 15 British philanthropists who'd love to poke a stick in the eye of their American friends. <laughs> so I just always chuckled about that as the, the one that got away. But I think it would have been a fast, I think anything we can do to, to tell the story, a history of this country is, is a necessity because I think we've lost it uh, with what's going on right now and nowadays. People really don't understand what, what people fought for and what they were trying to do. So you're uh, kind of a history buff. I am a history buff. Always have been. Okay, how about the history of the community? Well, again, I know somewhat of the history of the community, and in fact, um, the uh, Historical Society is living in a building that the city was able to let them have for a dollar, um, of which I was able to get funding from the state for a million dollars to fix up that building so that the Historical Society could move into it. You know, so from the city's perspective, we've done a great deal in the sense of the history for the community to try to keep the history of the community. Um, my knowledge of the history of the community is somewhat minimal, but uh, you know, I, I, I know about the uh, issues we had trying to get water, clean water into the city and the fight that occurred with that back in the early 1900s. There's a lot of interesting stories of, of what occurred. But again, from my perspective, the city has been looking at how we can help the historical society to a point. Okay. Now the um, county needs, I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna cause trouble, but the county needs to step up their act. It's a county historical society. They need to step up their, their act and how to help the, the historical well, society. Well, yeah, it is a county historical society. They contribute and yeah, I the know. city contributes and that's an issue between the city and the county. Oh, now you're wimping out. <laughs> this is not a discussion that, that I should really push here. We're talking about Mayor John Antaramian and Mr. Right. I just couldn't pass that up. <laughs> okay, um, we'll talk about a couple of challenges that you faced. Um, in your first tenure, there was the shooting of Michael Bell. Mm -hmm. the son of Michael, and I don't remember his middle initial, Bell. Mm -hmm. um, and what kind of challenges did that create around the community and how did it get dealt with? And again, it's hard to, I mean, whenever someone loses a child, you know, it's always hard, and I understand that. Um, in the case of the, uh, Michael Bell, Michael Bell has done what he wants to do, which I disagree with. I think I would have taken the money that he has spent and targeted to programs for young people uh, so that what happened to his son doesn't happen to somebody else. 
That's not his, what he has decided to do. He's gone a different route. That's his prerogative. However, it's nothing that anyone is going to say or do that's going to change his mind. How has that affected the community, or do you think it isn't really a big effect on the I don't community? know that it's a huge effect on the community anymore. I think that at the time, any shooting, they, the, the, um, you know, the shooting at the McDonald's impacted the community. And that, in the case, was a relative of mine who was killed. I mean, so it, it, any type of, uh, all, all violence in different ways impacts the community all the time. We've been fortunate in this community. The amount of violent crime we have in this community is small in compared to any other city of our size. Um, law enforcement here has done an excellent job in general, and I would tell you that um, you know, we have a clearance rate that is excellent, and we have less crime than a lot of other communities, than most other communities, and actually most other communities our size. Okay, well then let's talk about another, the other challenge in 19, uh, 2020 with the shooting of Jacob Blake. Mm -hmm. That sparked a lot of anxiety, protest, and in some respects violence. How did that affect the community? How did you respond to tone it down? Well, you tried to tone it down whenever these things occur. I mean, I, there's one day which I, you know, I, I had my police department that was a little upset with me because I waded into the crowd and tried to talk people to calm down, you know, try to calm down the situation. Uh, it didn't work, uh, but it, it, to me it was important to try. And, and I've never been one who's been afraid to walk into a crowd, so it's, I, I did it. And, and uh, tried to convince people that it was, this wasn't the route to go. Protesting is fine. Violent protesting is not acceptable. Uh, militias are not acceptable. None of that helps the community. Um, in this case, the press wasn't overly helpful either because they, I think, um, wanted to tell a certain story and they told a certain story. Not, and that has nothing to do with liberal or conservative press. Both sides did what they wanted to do. And, and to me, that was inappropriate, but that's the way it goes. Um, my job is to try to make sure that I keep people safe. Uh, called in the National Guard, literally made the call two, three hours after the incident occurred. Um, and so we tried to deal with it accordingly. The Guard came the next day. Um, not enough, but again, there's a process that, that you know, they, they walk through because they have to be in other communities also. It's not just Kenosha that was having trouble at that time. So everyone, I, I believe that people did what they needed to do. The police department, I think, did an excellent job in what they were doing. Um, if you'll notice that um, at least the lawsuits that have been either dismissed or settled, um, the city has not paid any money out to anyone on any of those. Um, so people did what they were supposed to do and they did it the right way. Okay. Now that doesn't always satisfy everybody because a lot of people think we should have done it differently. Well, um, and I understand, but the, but the, you know, we follow the law. And sometimes when you follow the law, people are not happy with you because they want certain things to happen in certain ways. Um, that's not how it works. Um, I had every faith in the police department and uh, allowed them to run the operations the way they needed to, along with the sheriff's department, who you know, basically takes over on, on these things, and the National Guard. All of them worked together. They did what they needed to do. And I can only say that there are a lot of people that worked very hard to protect everyone. Okay. There was, at that time, I believe, a lot of fear and worry and boarding up storefronts and trying to protect uh, doors, windows, and all of that. Now, three and a half years later, do you think that fear and those concerns have kind of gone away or lessened, or do you think there's oh, still think, that back? I think they've lessened, but I'm, again, perception sometimes is the hardest thing to change. And if there are people who are afraid, because of what happened, you're not going to change that perception overnight. I will tell you though, if you look at Kenosha and look at all the other cities that had um, riots and protests and damage done, I would venture a guess that Kenosha is probably the only city that has removed the, the properties that were burned down, have redevelopment going on in those properties and has worked with setting up a committee that has been working, different committees working on different issue, social issues within the community. Um, 
those are things that we've done and will continue to do. Because I've told everyone from, the, from when the riots first occurred, you're not going to change anything with a one-year blip of, oh, we're going to meet for a year and fix this. That's not how it works. It has to be a constant dialogue. And the city has been trying to do that. Okay. You have decided not to run for re-election in 2024. Mm -hmm. Did your health issues from the 2019 heart attack play into that, or were there other issues? Well, health issues always play into everything, but the health issue is not the only reason that you, you make a determination. And everyone will always tell you family issues, and that's true also to play into it. But again, it goes back to a number of things, family, health, but also the, the issue of there's a time, and I, I, I probably will get into trouble with this statement, that sometimes politicians need to know it's just time to go and it's time to walk away and let someone else take over um, and let, some, you know, let someone else deal with the issues and see how they do. Um, and I just felt it was time for me to, to walk away and um, you know, spend some time with my wife, do some tra a little bit of travel while we can, you know, those type of things. Okay. One last thing I wanted to bring up was you mentioned housing couple different times mm -hmm. in our conversation um, and the city has a, a program or an agreement with Uline and you have the uptown lofts and the residents downtown and the we residential in the Kin neighborhood. Is there a lack of affordable housing in Kenosha? Well and, and here's what my question back to you is what's affordable? I could ask that same question. That's exactly okay. right. That's the problem that everyone has, is what's affordable. I look at it from a different perspective. I look at it from the perspective of not affordability, but income-ability. So a person making $50,000 today, family making $50,000, can they afford a house? And if the answer is no, then why? And then you need to start looking at how do you, if that's the case, how do we make it so that people from that 50,000 to potentially 150,000 are able to afford a basic house as to what it's going to cost. Right now, if you try to buy a house in Kenosha, or you build a house in Kenosha, you're in the $300,000 range, easy, without batting an eye, and that's a small house. If you're looking at buying one of the small bungalows in Kenosha, out in, let's use um, Forest Park, the 1,000 square foot homes, 900 to 1,000 square foot homes, you're looking at 180 to $200,000 to buy that house. If someone is making $50,000, can they afford that house? And the answer to that is that interest rates at 6%, probably not, or it's gonna be difficult. So what do we need to do as a city to make it so that things are affordable, so that people in that range actually can afford to live or own a house and, 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 and impact the American dream? Some people will say we shouldn't be doing anything because that's just the market, let the market dictate. However, as we grow and we get new companies coming in, not every company is going to be paying every employee $100,000 plus. So if that's the case, what do we need to do to make sure that housing is affordable? And that's kind of what the U-Line concept is, is that you look at that. You do mixture of housing. housing make, you have to have a different mixture of housing throughout the city, and if you don't, you're never going to solve your problem with housing. And right now, housing is a major issue. Okay. Um, at one time, there was a formula that people should spend up to 30% of their income on housing. Housing. If I were to make $20 an hour. Well, use the easy way. Use $50,000 income. Just use a $50,000 income and figure out if you're using 30, was it 30% you said? Yeah. 30% of $50,000, $15,000 roughly for your housing. Can you pay taxes and uh, interest and everything else on a home that is $250,000 on that, that uh, income basis? And you would have a hard time doing it especially when the first 20% of your income is already taken away from you with withholding. So you have less to work with. So my point being, I go back to what my point is, is that it's not a simple issue. Um, 
you can do a mixture of things uh, with, with some rental properties. Like I said, the uptown rent is $1,100. Down at the lakefront, it's 2000 plus. Out on the interstate, it's almost 3000 in some places. You, you have a broad range of, of, of income levels. Part of the problem is our neighbors. Nothing against our neighbors, but our neighbors don't want low-income housing, what they'll classify low-income housing anyplace. So you don't see a lot of workforce housing being placed in other areas, which is problematic. It needs to be scattered. Workforce housing should be everywhere. It shouldn't be in one location. Low-income housing should all be in one spot. Okay. So how do you see the future of Kenosha coming after you leave? I think Kenosha has a wonderful opportunity. I think the Kin neighborhood will be a total difference maker. Um, I think that will lead us into the next change that the city has. This city has gone through a lot of different situations and has you know, been reinvented more than once. You know, when Chrysler pulled out, we ended up having to be re we reinvented ourselves. Um, when we built the industrial parks, we started reinventing ourselves. When the warehousing came in, we reinvented ourselves. I think the Kin neighborhood and entrepreneurship will be a huge reinvention of the community. I think what we're trying to do in the uptown with the education and the opportunities there will be a huge benefit to the community and change the community. Um, housing is, like I said, the downtown plan will stimulate the economics in the downtown area dramatically. I mean, so all of these things will have an impact, but probably one of the biggest impacts that no one talks about is the impact of the city expanding west. The city, when I came back, was in the middle of a fight, or actually we just started the fight, uh, with the uh, town of Summers, the, ta uh, the, the village of Summers, the town of Paris, and the county, which had made a decision to try to landlock the city. And that was one of the bigger fights that we had, and the city won. I shouldn't say we won. You, because if you win, then there are other people who are losing. Let's just say we came to an arrangement that benefited everyone in the end. And so I think that was very, very important. That's probably one of the more, most important things that we've gotten accomplished, other than the downtown and the Kin, you know, Harbor Park and the Kin neighborhood. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me.